Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And uh, welcome to everyone who's joined us uh, online as well. Uh, my name is Josh Slater. It's my honour and privilege to be an Associate Dean in the Faculty of Science. I'm also a member of staff here in the Vet School. And it's my genuine pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Melbourne and Melbourne Veterinary School's Werribee campus. Um, I'll say a few words about what lies ahead for today and then hand over to our keynote speaker, Professor Muddy Campbell, in just a few minutes. Now, we believe this is a unique event and we're absolutely thrilled that you've all uh, made the effort to come here. And I know that we've got people from across all of the Australian states uh, and internationally, uh, New Zealand and the UK, and we have an international and national audience online. What makes this unique, we believe, is that this is a gathering of like-minded people from across a very wide range of disciplines and sectors that uh, use animals in sport. And we're absolutely thrilled to have representation from all of the major equestrian disciplines, uh, everything from racing through equestrianism into a wide range of other disciplines. And welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming and everything from professional down to grassroots. And that cross section of the horse industry is really important. Not only that, we have dogs in sport represented. In the room, we have Greyhound Racing represented uh, and online we have Greyhound Racing and sled dogs. And we think this is quite an unusual opportunity to bring together such a wide range of disciplines that use animals in sport in all sorts of different ways. And the reason why we've done this is because it's quite difficult for us in our own industry areas to really know what's going on in other sectors. And we tend to think of our problems as different uh, or perhaps special or unique. But I think what we'll learn today as we go through the day that actually the concerns that we face, both from internally and externally, are probably common. And I suspect there are common solutions to what the future of animals welfare in sport looks like. And today is all about taking a future focus. We understand well what the current state looks like, but I'm sure there'll be some useful sharing of ideas about what's happening in each of our, our sectors. And the panel uh, session that we have at the end of the morning will be an opportunity to draw out some of that information. But today is really about looking forwards and thinking not just what does what good welfare look like now, but what does it need to look like in five years or 10 years time? And we don't want today to be a one-off. We don't want this to be uh, an occasion where we come together, have some good dis discussion, and then there's nothing further from that. We want this to be the start of something long-term. We want there to be tangible outputs from today. So, um, we, the organisers, have committed to writing this up and to publishing an account of today. And if you're wondering why we asked you to complete that consent form, it's because we need your permission to talk about today and what you've all con contributed. So thank you for giving your consent for that. The act of publishing what we talk about today is important because it becomes a record that's in the literature and becomes searchable. And then it's something that we and others can refer back to. I hope it will also give you some tangible outputs that you can put into play back in your own organizations. And what we'd like to think very much is that today will be the start of something long running. The reason for this is that we will have common problems. We will have shared solutions. And our joined up voice across the animal sectors will be much stronger than our individual voices. This is all about really thinking about what can we do better by working together. And we hope that you, everyone here today, both in the room and online, will become the start of a powerful coalition. And we'd very much like you to become the leaders and the champions for this sort of cross discipline cross-species, future welfare focus. So that's why we're here today. It's about bringing you together. It's about sharing ideas. 
and looking to, to the future. We've set the day up with some information delivery at the start. So we have uh, our keynote speaker who I'll introduce in a few, few minutes that will set the scene. Uh, Julie Feeder and I will be doing two very short setup sessions, really posing some questions. Then we go into the panel and that's going to be really about thinking about what's the current state look like. Break for lunch and then we're going to the workshop sessions that this afternoon which is all about that future focus. What do we need to look on? And I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be some great discussion and so good to have you here. So that's the, why we're here. Uh, let me just run through some important uh, details before we get underway. Um, today's only possible because of you and your willingness to come and give up your time. And thank you again for that. It's also um, possible only because of our kind sponsors that we've had. Very grateful to University of Melbourne and Melbourne Veterinary School for donating the use of the facilities for today. And for our sponsors, World Horse Welfare and Greyhound Racing Victoria, and also University of Nottingham, who we're doing this venture in partnership with. And we'll talk about the future and next steps of keeping this powerful coalition moving at the end of this afternoon. Uh, but this is something that we are doing internationally with through University of Melbourne, University of Nottingham, and I hope all of you. Before we begin the meeting itself, I would like to pause for a moment and acknowledge all First Nations peoples from the various countries that are represented here from across all of the states of Australia, from New Zealand, and from any other parts of the uh, world. I'd like to pay on behalf of all of us my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We're on Bunurong country here. Uh, for those of you who came out from Melbourne, when you cross the Yarra River, you cross from Wurundjeri land into Bunurong country. And I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong people as the traditional owners of these unceded lands on which this lovely campus uh, sits. I'd also like to acknowledge all First Nations people across Australia, New Zealand and the rest of the world as uh, our first scientists and One Health practitioners. And something that's very pertinent for today is that uh, around the world, uh, especially in Australia, but in all regions, First Nations knowledge systems have recognised the key concepts of animal sentience and animal agency for tens of thousands of years. And these are concepts which are only now just becoming embedded into our westernised animal welfare laws. And you'll know that they're a central feature of the new animal welfare um, provisions in Vic Victoria. And sentience and ag agency are going to play very large today. Uh, and I think it's really important that we acknowledge um, First Nations people as having recognised this for tens of thousands of years. We're still catching up. So um, I'd also like to uh, pay my respects to any First Nations people who may be with us today, either in the room or online. So thank you again for joining. I would just like to say two words about Melbourne but Veterinary School, it's a very special place. Uh, we are Australia's first vet, vet school. The gentleman on your left is William Kendall. He was an enterprising young British vet from Lancashire who um, decided to head off to the uh, new world to uh, find a new start and set sail for New Zealand from Liverpool. And in 1880, arrived in Melbourne, a booming gold rush city full of animals and only a handful of vets and he decided this is where he would settle opened a veterinary practice a real entrepreneur in all, all senses and opened a private veterinary school private veterinary college uh, it's on brunswick street many of you will have walked past it it's the building with the gold or set above the door it now belongs to anglia catholic university but it's still there and that was the origin of the school uh, this campus was established in uh, 1962 uh, we are still Victoria's only vet school, and we're very proud of that history, uh, but we're also very forward looking. And the campus is very much a reflection of that. You'll have noticed the lovely landscaping and the beautiful new buildings. This lecture theatre is one of the older parts, but it sits underneath uh, this building on the right of your screen, the learning and teaching building that opened in 2019. 
And I think it's one of the best examples of beautiful modern learning architecture. And I think you'll be inspired when you're up there. You're on the second floor of that building for the workshops th this afternoon. This building was designed very carefully to acknowledge um, its place in Bunurong land and culture. And you'll notice if you step outside that the building architecture, the fabrics and materials blend beautifully into the environment. It's got a strong sense of place. And do look out for references, very respectful references to indigenous animals as you walk around the building. Uh, you won't have noticed, but when you walked in from the front door to here along the uh, concrete floor, um, there are brass rings set into the floor. They represent uh, air bubbles of platypus as they feeding and going about their business. And each floor has a reference to indigenous animals of reference. So see if you can spot them there by the lift shafts, but you'll see echidna spines, you'll see possum fur, and you'll see wedgetail eagle feathers re re represented. And um, that's very important to us that we recognize in the place that we live and work, the, the sense of place that our building uh, has. So here's the timetable for today, and I'll hand over to Mandy in a second. Um, so we have our keynote lecture coming up next, then two short presentations uh, from me and Julian. We're all about sort of presenting, posing some questions and um, setting up with some background uh, information ready for the later sessions. Quick break, uh, tea and coffee. And Julie, do you want to just give us a quick brief on tea and coffee arrangements? Uh, yes, so I've got instant tea and coffee up against the back wall of the kitchen. Um, so I'm not so used to the kitchen. We've <laughs> uh, got cafe and lunch for the workshop. So we've got a few people in the room here that not going to the workshop, but that'll be up on level two. Um, and then tea, instant tea and coffee up there as well. But if you want, you know, a proper cafe, like the lineup for the box or pre-order. Great. Thank, thanks, Joe. We then come back for the panel and we've got an international panel, incredibly high caliper people, uh, a range of equestrian disciplines and greyhound racing. So Maddie Campbell, Janet Horton, Janet Douglas, Michelle Ledger, Grace Forbes, thank you to all of you for coming. Very much appreciate that. Quick lunch break and then up to the second floor of the new building. Julie will help direct everyone upstairs. Uh, lunch is served up there. And then we go into the afternoon session, which is the future focus, uh, thinking about the future of animal welfare and ethics uh, in sport. So I think that's um, all I need to say. Just final housekeeping things. Uh, there are no fire drills scheduled for today. So if the alarm does go off, we do need to leave the building. Um, you can follow me, I'll be the first one out. Uh, the, um, the assembly point is behind you on the lawn outside, so the best way out is just through the back door, but you can exit through this door, turn right and right, and you'll see everyone gathering on the uh, lawn. Uh, toilets, if you haven't found them, are about uh, 20 metres down the corridor to your right, so just exit out of here and turn right, and you'll see them there clearly signposted. Um, and I think that's all I need to say, Julie. Right. So let me um, welcome our keynote speaker, Professor, Professor Maddy Campbell, who's flown in from the UK um, en route to the ICS conference in New Zealand, but really great that you could uh, stop off in Melbourne and uh, give your talk. Maddy, for those of you who don't know, he's one of the uh, world's leading uh, opinion leaders in animal ethics. Um, I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, it, one of the le world's leading opinion leaders in animal ethics. She's professor of um, veterinary ethics at Nottingham University and has, a, I think, a fairly unique position in having been a key advisor to both uh, equestrian sports through the FBI and also greyhound racing through Greyhound Racing Board of U UK. So, Maddie, thank you so much for talking to us today and very much looking forward to hearing your talk. Morning, everyone, and uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to start off with a few uh, thank yous of, of my own. Thank you to the University of Melbourne and the Vet School for hosting us. Heartfelt thank yous from me to, to Josh and Julie for having uh, collaborated in, in this idea of getting this work going between our two universities and engaging with all of you um, across sports. I am so grateful to both of you and particularly for the massive amount of administrative work Julie's done. Julie, thank you very, very much 
indeed. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, to World Tools uh, Welfare for having made this event possible and to Greyhound Racing Victoria for further support. It, it's lovely to have both uh, sports in, involved in supporting this meeting. And thank you from me to all of you as well um, for, for making use of your time to be here. We know you're all very busy professionals and it means a lot that you've all joined us today. And, and Josh has already um, explained why we think that's important. I think, um, I hope that as I go through my talk, I'll be able to explain to you why I personally um, think it's actually critical that all of us working across the range of sports that use non-human animals um, do work together in order uh, to ensure that those sports can continue. Um, declarations of interest, just to be very transparent are up front, um, you can see those of mine, which I think are relevant, uh, listed on the side there. So I thought since we have um, joined from a number of different sports and from different countries as well, it might make sense to start by uh, just doing a little bit of a context uh, setting about um, where we all are. And this will be familiar to each of you, of course, in your own sports, but perhaps you don't know what's been going on so much in, in the other sports. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes um, giving you some examples of, of that. The social license for using non-human animals in sport is something um, which has become a familiar concept to all of us in this room, probably, over the last couple of years. And, and that is thanks in, in large part to the work of World Source Welfare, and particularly, in fact, to this paper, which was published with Janet Douglas as the lead author. Janet's here uh, today, and she's going to be on the panel later this morning. And, and that's really got everyone talking about the social license for using non-human animals in sport and whether or not the public in all of our countries and internationally um, still finds it morally and ethically acceptable that we should be using non-human animals in that way. All of you will be able to think of examples from your own sport of the kind of headlines that have appeared around this um, discussion. And in the UK, which obviously is my major area of experience, when I look back, a lot of the discussion started, I think, about a decade ago, actually. And one can almost pinpoint it. It's funny how, in retrospect, one can sometimes see moments in time at which you know things started to change. And we have a, a race in the UK called the Grand National, which is this big, long steeplechase race with very large fixed fences. And over a decade ago, um, now, it had been becoming a little bit controversial for a, a while, and about a decade ago, a bit longer now, um, the vet, there was a moment or a year in which the vets who were responsible for looking after the horses involved in that race asked that if a horse fell on the first lap, it could be left in place for them to treat. It's a two-lap race, and before that, the practice had been to try and move the horse quickly off the track so that the horses on the second lap would be able to continue unhindered. And, and the vets thought it was more in the horse's interest if the horse could stay still and they could treat it if it had fallen. And so that was what they asked to do. And that was what was agreed to for welfare reasons. Um, and it then got shown on television. So that's what you can see in the bottom left of this slide. And for the first time, many of the people who watched that race realised what had actually been going on for many years because they could clearly see the horses in the second lap being diverted around a horse that was still being treated on, on the floor. And that actually, I think, was a bit of a moment of realisation for the, for the public about what using animals in sport actually involved. And in my mind's eye, when we look back now, I think that was certainly a trigger for the kind of conversation that's evolved uh, since then. And, and the interesting things about that, I think, are, are A, that the decisions that were made were made for what, very good welfare reasons and were entirely appropriate veterinary decisions, and B, uh, the way in which the public reacted to that and their kind of increased awareness of, of the way in which humans were using uh, animals. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit um, later about public awareness about how non-human animals are, are living. And then the conversation went on from there in the UK, at least. So having started off really around horse racing, it fairly uh, rapidly then evolved to evolve, involve um, other equestrian sports as well. And you can see some examples here. So for in dressage, for example, um, the issue of hyperflexion, so-called rolker, um, is one that's that's been a lot of discussion about. And in inventing the issue of rotational falls, there's been concern about. Um, and of course, that actually relates to concern for the well-being, not only of the equine athletes, but also of the human 
athletes. So across equestrian um, sports over the last decade plus, uh, there have been an increasing number of, of headlines, of discussions about uh, the way in which non-human animals, equine athletes being used in sport are being treated. And this is a slide uh, which is taken from those of the Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission of the FEI, on which I was lucky enough to be invited to sit for the last couple of years. And it just demonstrates uh, some of those headlines from across the world. You will all have your own examples, I'm sure, from your sports and, and your countries of similar kind of things. And, and it hasn't been only to do with horses. So the reason we're all uh, in this room today, you know, from, from greyhound racing and sled dog uh, racing, as, as well as the equestrian world, is that the conversation has uh, also rapidly evolved to include other non-human animals who are used in sports. So again, uh, in, the, in Great Britain at the moment, uh, greyhound racing is a, a matter of public conversation. Uh, we are facing calls for a ban on greyhound racing from three of the large canine charities and the Scottish parliaments and Welsh parliaments are currently uh, consulting about it. So it's quite high up on the political agenda back home. And I know that in the sled dog world uh, also um, there have been some uh, media concerns ab about all of that. And, and we'll come back and talk a bit more about uh, the role of media in this later on. Over the last couple of years, um, there have been some really interesting surveys done. The first was done by World Horse uh, Welfare, and you can see the results of that here. It showed that 40% of those they surveyed only supported the continued involvement of horses in sport if more safety and welfare measures were put in place. Um, over half felt that welfare should be prioritized more in communications. Interestingly, 16% felt that their confidence about the protection of horse welfare had been negatively affected by media coverage. Um, and again, I'm going to come back and talk about media coverage in a few moments' time. Um, and then you can see at the bottom of this slide that um, one in five people actually didn't support the continued involvement of horses in sport under any circumstances. And, and that's an important message uh, for all of us who are, are working in these sports. The FEI, Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission, also ran uh, two big surveys as part of its uh, work. They were international surveys. They had huge numbers of respondents, as you can see here. Uh, those from the equestrian community, in other words, from FEI, uh, equestrian stakeholders, and those from what's described as the general public, which are other equestrian uh, stakeholders, but non-FEI. And what was interesting about those surveys um, was that 67% of the public respondents uh, said they were concerned about the involvement of horses in equestrian sport um, and specifically concerned about welfare. Uh, and so the message that's coming out of all of these is that um, it is not only external stakeholders who are concerned about the welfare of the non-human animals we're using, in sport. These, these surveys, the World Horse Welfare ones and the FEI ones, between them very clearly showed that actually the majority of internal equestrian stakeholders are concerned about the welfare of the horses who are involved in equestrian sport. And that is a really important message for us to understand, although it may not come as a surprise to those of us in the room today, because actually we are ourselves some of those internal stakeholders, and I certainly count myself uh, as one of those. Now, from some um, stakeholders, that criticism is absolute. That's the kind of 20% we saw in the previous side who just don't support the use of animals in sport, whatever, however good the welfare would be. They just think it is not ethically acceptable, full stop. And I'll explain that in terms of ethical theory in a few moments' time. But, but a lot of the criticism is not absolute, it's relative in the sense that it's coming from people who don't philosophically object to the use of non-human animals in sport, but they think it's only ethical providing we do it properly. In other words, providing we appropriately protect the welfare. And Julie's gonna talk about safeguarding welfare later this morning. Um, and, and that is certainly my own position. It's certainly uh, the view that was reflected in, in those surveys from World Horse Welfare and the FEI Commission. As far as I know, uh, similar surveys haven't been 
undertaken with greyhounds or with sled dogs, but we can see that there's a similar concern there also from internal stakeholders, because, for example, in, in Great Britain, we have this comprehensive welfare strategy being delivered by the Greyhound Board of Great Britain. And for example, uh, in the world of sled dog racing, we have these uh, guidelines being produced by the vets who are involved in that, which are aimed at protecting uh, the welfare of those sled dogs. So there's obviously internal stakeholder concern as well as external concern. And the internal concern is that we should do things properly in the sense of properly uh, optimizing and safeguarding welfare. Now, um, we're going to spend a lot of today talking about uh, welfare, as I already mentioned. Julie's going to talk about safeguarding it in a few minutes' time. Josh is going to talk to us about whether uh, horses and animals involved in sport can have positive experiences uh, in the course of that involvement. So I'm not going to talk much more about welfare. I'm going to concentrate instead uh, on talking about ethics. Um, and it's an important distinction because, as I always try to explain to my students, ethics is not the same as welfare. Now, ethics is described as a normative subject, and that's one of those things I always have trouble remembering what it means. So the way in, in which I explain it to myself is that ethics is about whether we should do something at all, whether it should be done, whether it ought to be done, how we value things, which things are good and bad, which actions are right and wrong. Whereas welfare in comparison, in my mind, is about how we ought to do things if we think we should be doing it at all. So if, for example, we think it is ethically justifiable to use animals in sport, then how do we do that in terms of optimizing their welfare? So they're different, ethics and welfare, but you can see, of course, that they absolutely tie in to each other because very often our ethical decision-making about whether or not we think something uh, is acceptable is informed by what we know about the welfare impacts of that activity. And so as an ethicist, it's really important that we're able to rely upon the work of welfare scientists to provide us with the evidence base that we need to make practical applied ethical decisions. And, and what that means is that in terms of welfare, what we should be trying to do always is to minimize negative uh, welfare impacts and maximize positive welfare impacts. Because as Professor uh, Christopher Wath is, who you can see here is one of my great mentors and the person who got me involved in ethics to begin with, um, as he explained in relation to farm animals, you know, it, it's rarely the case that the use of animals, human use of animals, is ethically acceptable if the animal's having um, a preponderance of negative welfare effects. Those kind of animals literally don't have lives worth living, as he described it. And this was an idea which was uh, developed by Professor David Meller, who of course will be uh, very familiar to, to many of you down here in, in this part uh, of the world. He went on to develop this idea of minimizing negative welfare effects, of maximizing positive welfare effects. And he kind of developed the idea of having lives worth living uh, into one of, of animals having a good life. So in other words, not just a, a kind of bare minimum of, of lives which were not so appalling that they'd be better off dead, but actually a positive standard of animals' experiences um, being good when taken across their lifetime. And, and that's a, a really important uh, part of, of what David Meller um, developed and, and explained. Um, so the idea is, is that an animal may experience some negative welfare impacts, it will experience some positive uh, welfare impacts, but um, when taken across its lifetime, if the positive outweigh the negative, then we can say that that animal has a good life. And, and that the second part of that sentence is important um, for those of us who are using animals in sport, because what it means, it, it actually supplies one of our ethical justifications for using animals in sport, because it means that if at any one moment in time, an animal has a negative experience, for example, if it gets injured, providing that that is immediately identified, appropriately treated, they get good veterinary care and so forth, and that for the rest of their lives, the animals are experiencing positive welfare effects, then overall, when taken across their lifetime, from the animal's point of view, they will have had a good, positive life. And, and that's an important thing for us to be able to explain. And it reiterates, again, the importance of, of welfare effects informing our ethical decision making.
And it kind of makes sense because none of us as humans actually expect that we're going to swan through life not having any negative effects. We just hope that overall our experience of life uh, will be a positive one. Now, one could make the same argument, um, of course, about um, animals which we were using for meat production. So we could say, um, well, yes, you know, at the end of their lives, those animals are going to be transported and they're going to be held as an abattoir before they're slaughtered. So there will be negative impacts at the end of their lives. But providing that for the rest of their lives, they are appropriately looked after, their welfare needs are met and so forth, we could nonetheless argue that across their lifetimes, those farm animals could be given uh, a good life. And, and this kind of flags up um, to me something that I think is, is a, a real issue at the moment, and it's almost too big an issue to talk about in this meeting, but it's something I think we all need to be aware of, which is there are quite incoherent public attitudes at the moment. So there are, are quite a lot of people who would say they oppose the use of non-human animals in sport and yet don't oppose the use, for example, um, of, of animals for food sources uh, for humans, and they don't um, object to dogs being bred, which um, can't breathe normally every day of their lives, although they do object to greyhounds uh, racing, which are actually much healthier animals than, than a lot of the dogs which are being used as pets. And they find it um, quite cute and entertaining to see uh, dogs being used as, as fashion items. So there is something incoherent about this. You know, the public generally is, is not thinking very logically about human use of animals, and, and they have, uh, to some extent, kind of singled out the use of non-human animals in sport. And I think uh, this is, is a point which was made by J.M. Curtsy in relation to the use of animals for meat production and his excellent novella, The Lives of Animals. For those of you who haven't uh, read it already, I, I highly recommend it. And the point he made was that really uh, people aren't thinking about how the meat that's on their plate got there. I mean, they'd, they'd almost rather not know about that. And, and people often, not all people, obviously, some people think about that kind of thing very carefully and very seriously, but, but there are certainly some people who are not really thinking very logically about all human uses of non-human animals. And the important point for us, I think, is I, to my mind, there's nothing ethically distinct about using animals in sport compared to using them for actually any other use which humans put animals to. All human uses of animals put those animals at risk, whether we be using them in sport, whether we be using them for food production, whether we be using them um, as pets. I mean, you know, we all have pet dogs and generally speaking, there isn't much objection to that. Although interestingly, I see in, in the Companions Animals in New Zealand uh, meeting in 10 days time, one of the topics for debate is going to be whether or not it's going to be ethically acceptable to have companion animals. Yeah, in a few years' time. But at the moment, most of you know the public is is not terribly concerned about that. We think it's quite reasonable to keep a dog as a pet. Well, dogs are actually pack animals, you know, and let the, the vast majority of them are kept as solitudinous animals and are left by their own for some hours each day and so forth. So that use of animals, and it is a use by humans uh, of non-human animals, also has negative effects, or at least the potential for negative effects. Uh, on the animals, as does using them in laboratory science, of course. And an argument that sometimes seems to be made around this is, oh, but, you know, the use of animals in sport is trivial. It's, it's not important. It's something we don't need to do. And therefore, putting them at risk is not acceptable. But actually, all of these human uses of non-human animals, with the exception probably of using them in laboratory science to produce human medicines, are trivial. They're all things we don't really need to be doing. So I don't think that there is anything ethically distinct about using animals in sport. And, and I think that's something uh, we need to be aware of when we involve ourselves in conversations around this. Now, the kind of argument which I've just um, made, that, you know, that there's kind of nothing worse um, about using animals in sport than there is about uh, having brachycephalic dogs as pets, for example, um, some people would, would say, well, that, that's a fallacious argument because two wrongs don't make a right. And, and if you take 
uh, an absolutist animal rights point of view, and, and I mean animal rights here in a philosophical sense, a deontological rights-based view, not a kind of uh, animal rights activist type of thing, but a philosophical approach to ethics, an absolutist animal rights point of view, as Tom Reagan did here, you can see on the screen here, in which you think that scented animals are, are subjects of a life, um, that they have interests in their own life, that they have certain rights which need to be respected and that key amongst those is the right not to be injured or killed, and importantly, and not to have free choice limited by humans. Uh, then logically, of course, using animals in sport wouldn't be acceptable, and nor, in fact, would any of those other uses of animals which I've just described. So if that is your approach to ethics, to animal ethics, then yes, it's true um, you know, two wrongs don't make a right, and you don't think any human use of, of non-human animals is ethically acceptable. And that is a perfectly valid uh, philosophical approach. But it's not what the majority of society thinks at the moment. The majority of Western society, at least, does still think that it's acceptable to use animals, for example, as pets, the, you know, vegetarians and vegans are still not the majority, although, of course, an increasing number of people do have uh, those dietary preferences, but a substantial number of people still think it's acceptable for us to use animals as a source of food. And yet many of those people uh, don't think it's acceptable to be using animals in sport. So what is going on here? They haven't got an absolutist animal rights view of, of human use of non-human animals, and yet they're worried about using animals in sport, and, and that would include some of those internal stakeholders I was talking about at the beginning. So what's going on? I think what's going on is that the people who are expressing these concerns are wittingly or unwittingly uh, undertaking what we call a utilitarian analysis of the use of animals in sport. So they're thinking about the harms and the benefits to animals, maybe to humans as well, of using non-human animals in sport, and they're weighing those up um, and they're coming to the conclusion that the harms, or at least the potential harms, are outweighing the benefits. Um, and, and this is a kind of utilitarian, utilitarian analysis, uh, which is was originally actually came from uh, the work of Jeremy Bentham way back in 1789. And in those days, uh, people weren't very concerned about animal welfare because they they were kind of focused on the fact that animals, in their view, um, couldn't rationalise didn't really reason and therefore weren't important. And, and Benson said, no, that's that's not what's important. What's important, the question is not whether they can reason, whether they can talk, the question is whether they can suffer. And of course, that's absolutely where we are at today. And it comes to the sentience point that Joshua was talking about earlier. Nowadays, we think about animal welfare very much in terms of whether animals can suffer and their ability to experience, in fact, both negative and positive things. Uh, and of course, that's also the utilitarian view, which was um, further developed by, by Peter Singer, who you can also see here. And that, I think, is the way in which the majority of, of the public and probably many of us in this room are thinking about the use of animals in sport. We're thinking about the harms, we're thinking about the benefits, we're thinking about the sentient non-human animals' ability to experience their own lives, to experience both positive and negative effects. And we're saying, well, how do those weigh up? Can we justify using animals in sport? Do we think that overall, across the animal's life, the positive welfare effects are outweighing the negative ones? Because if not, then it's hard for us to justify continuing that use. And so we come back to the importance of minimizing negative welfare effects and maximizing positive welfare effects in order to be able to provide uh, ethical justifications for using the animals in sport. And, and this is actually one of uh, the three so-called central tenets of the ethical framework for the use of horses in sport, uh, which World Horse Welfare kindly funded me to develop a few years ago, and which has been being developed and refined ever since. And for today's purposes, since we're talking not only about horses, but also about uh, dogs in, in at least two types of support, of sport, we can perhaps apply this framework to animals rather than just to horses. So it has these three central tenets, and I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes describing to you because I think and hope that they provide us when we take them in combination with a, a way of explaining our ethical justifications for using animals, non-human animals in sport. The first one I already covered. The next one is to do with um, 
identifying and mitigating avoidable unnecessary risks. So this idea of avoidable and unnecessary risk was first developed uh, by Professor David Morton, who you can see on the screen here, in fact, in relation to laboratory animals. Um, and essentially what it says is that um, there are risks which we can identify and um, which we then know what to do about and, and where we can identify them and where we have a way of mitigating them, we must do so because those are unnecessary risks in the sense that we can get rid of them or at least reduce them. Um, and what we are left with when we've done that is just the unavoidable risks, those which are actually, it's necessary to take if we're going to continue to use animals in this particular way at all. So in David's example, it was to do with laboratory animals. In our example, it's to do with using animals in sport. So the idea for us would be that we try and, and through research, through policy development, keep identifying the risks to animals and keep mitigating them so that we kind of constantly drive down those avoidable uh, risks and uh, and we keep getting left with the unavoidable ones. And then what we need to do is to make the unavoidable ones avoidable through research, through understanding what's causing them, through working out what we can do to mitigate them. And that way we keep um, hopefully kind of increasing the benefits and reducing the harms when we're doing that utilitarian analysis. And, and the question is, I suppose, from an ethical point of view, can we drive those uh, avoidable risks out? Can we make enough unavoidable risks avoidable and get rid of them to kind of be at a level at which we think um, the unavoidable risks are ethically acceptable? And that is, I suppose, the level you know, at which society would, would think it's, it's reasonable for the social license to use animals and sport to continue. Now, there's, there's an interesting analogy here, actually, from um, motorsports that those of you like myself who are in the room who are old enough to remember might um, recall that back in the 1970s, there was a space of very horrible, high profile uh, crashes in, in uh, Formula One motorsport and to the point at which the social license for that sport to continue came under threat. You know, it reached the point where everyone just thought this, this is not actually acceptable. Um, and what that sport then did was they undertook a massive amount of, of research, of policy development, and they made the sport safe enough that it kind of became okay for it to continue and the social license was maintained. And I think we're in a very similar position now um, with the use of non-human animals in sport is it's that's what we need to do. We keep need to keep mitigating these risks. We need to be making the unavoidable ones avoidable through research. And that is how we will optimize welfare, safeguard welfare, and, and therefore keep our social license. And then the third central tenet is um, that governing body regulations and the law should be complied with, which sounds like a kind of fairly low um, bar, but it is a really necessary one. Um, and it, it is really important that the pressure to do that comes from internal stakeholders as well as external stakeholders, so that those who are concerned about optimising welfare of non-human animals being used in sport make sure that when individual stakeholders fail to reach the standards, which we think are necessary, they are identified as being kind of rotten apples, as their behaviour not being the acceptable norm, and, and they are dealt with appropriately by the regulatory authorities. So I think that these central tenets of the ethical framework um, together kind of help us to explain why we think that the use of animals and sport is ethically justifiable, not only to external stakeholders, but also to those internal stakeholders who are concerned about welfare impacts. So those people who don't fundamentally disapprove of using non-human animals in sport, but who worry about that balance of harms and benefits. And that brings us back to this kind of interplay uh, between welfare and ethics. Now, we need to talk um, about ethics. And I've spent quite a lot of time, I've tried not to kind of go diverging too much uh, into ethical theories, because that's a whole different uh, lecture. But, but I have talked quite a lot about ethics and about how we can explain our ethical justifications for using non-human animals in competitive sport. And I think it's really important that we start to do that now in the public sphere. We are at a moment in time, it seems to me, and, and Josh described it earlier as this kind of 
moment from which we hope to go forwards now with all of you into the future um, in collaboration. We're at a moment in time where a lot of work has been done around welfare um, across sports, across species. The FEI Commission work is one example of that. The work that's been going on internationally in, in greyhound racing is another example of that. The work that's been going on um, with said dogs is a further example of that. There's all this work being going on about welfare, and that's good. And I do believe absolutely it is a necessary prerequisite um, for being able to ethically justify the use of animals in sport. But I think it's almost not enough because nonetheless, notwithstanding all of that work, and, and we all know where we are with that work as internal stakeholders, the public conversation, what is being heard in the public space still a lot, um, and notwithstanding you know, what has been going on with that welfare work, there are individuals and organizations who are choosing, in my view, quite deliberately actually to ignore a lot of that very positive work around welfare of the animals being used in sport and just keep reiterating in the public space that the use of non-human animals in competitive sport is unethical without actually providing very complex explanations for that assertion. And I think we need now at this moment in time when we've been doing that welfare work, where we want to move forward, I think we need to engage in that conversation and to be more proactive about explaining our ethical justifications for the continued use of animals in competitive sport. And th there's this article I published on um, this last year, if you're interested, it explains in some detail about how we can justify that in terms of each of the ethical theories. But I hope what I've been talking about for the last few minutes um, provides you with a basis for explaining how welfare informs ethical decision making and those three central points about our uh, our ethical justifications for using animals in sport, which are based in optimizing and safeguarding and protecting welfare. This um, is says a bit more about the ethical framework for the use of animals in sport. Uh, if you're uh, interested in it, as I said, it, its original development was kindly funded by World Horse Welfare, and they are also now funding uh, PhD student Bluebell Brown, uh, who is supervised by myself and Professor Verheyen and Dr. Cardwell. Um, and she is now developing it for use at grassroots level. And I'm not going to say any more about it today because that's kind of not the purpose of, of the talk, other than to say that it does provide a logical uh, and transparent method of ethical decision making. And, and it's one which we can apply across species and across sports. And I think that is an important point. It doesn't have to be this framework, but I think it is helpful when we're all talking together in collaboration across our sports and the public space about our ethical justifications for using non-human animals in sport, if we can talk in a similar fashion, if we can explain things in a similar way and in a very transparent way and in a very logical way that demonstrates that animal welfare is the heart of our decision-making processes, which it is, because if we are able to do that consistently, it's much easier for the public to understand than if we're all having slightly bit mill conversations. And that's a, a link to it, uh, if any of you are interested afterwards. So I think we need to talk about ethics very proactively. Um, and I think how we talk about ethics also matters. Um, something that I've been saying for a little while now is that I think it's really important that when we are speaking in the public space, we are very clear that we are concerned about welfare for its own sake, because it's the right thing to do. And I know that's true myself as an internal stakeholder across sports and across species. I know that is true, that there are lots of people within these sports who are genuinely very passionate about optimizing and protecting and safeguarding animal welfare. But I do worry a little bit that we've become so engaged in this conversation about social license, and it has been a necessary engagement, absolutely, that we sometimes, it, it almost sounds as if what we're concerned about is maintaining the social license rather than the welfare. And that, of course, is back to front. What we're concerned about genuinely is the welfare. And if we get the welfare right, then the social license will follow. But, but we need to be clear when we're speaking that the social license following is, is the kind of side effect, it's not our aim. I also think the language we use when we talk about animal ethics uh, is important. So 
when I first started speaking about this uh, a few years ago, I used to hear things coming back at me like, oh, well, you know, you can tell that uh, horses love to run because if the jockey falls off, they keep on racing. Well, of course, they keep on racing. You know, they're herd animals. Their instinct is to keep following the herd. So I don't you know, think that's a, a helpful argument. And I think it's, you know, the way in which uh, thinking around animal ethics has developed for the last decade about the way in which the public has engaged in that thinking, I, I don't think it's helpful for us to be kind of coming up with those rather trite uh, sayings. And, and uh, you know, another similar one is, oh, well, you know, these competition horses, they're best looked after horses and they get everything they could possibly need. Um, and I've put two pictures up here. I've, I've very carefully taken one from an advert for stables because I didn't want to put anyone's particular stable uh, up there. But the point I'm making is, you know, a lot of these competition horses, and one of the things the FEI Commission talked about was kind of the other 23 hours, the hour a day when the horse is not out of its stable being worked, are their welfare needs being met for those other 23 hours? And they may be in very beautifully designed stables. But as a friend of mine said to me when she bought her horse uh, to stay with us for breeding purposes, you know, effectively, however beautiful these stables are, they are just cages that we're keeping them in. And that is actually true. And so, you know, we can look at these very beautiful stables. We can look at my own two horses on the left here. This is what it looks like in Sussex in England, half the way through the winter. It's even worse now from a muddy point uh, of, of view. But I think um, that those horses are having their welfare needs better met by living out all the time, despite the weather, than they are standing in a stable for 23 hours a day, which is somewhat frustrating because I also spent a lot of money in expensive stables some years ago, and now I barely use them. But nonetheless, um, you know, <laughs> one's changing things as, as time goes by, and we need to challenge ourselves uh, to, to take on board the developing welfare science and to really think about whether we're meeting animals' welfare needs and to be careful about the language we're using to describe those. When we're engaging in this conversation about the ethical use um, of animals, we need to take other people's views seriously and respectfully. Um, we must be prepared to challenge ourselves, like I just said, the way in which we keep our horses at a very individual level. But things change over time. When I was a child, I used to get taken by my grandmother to the dolphin area in Brighton, and we used to spend happy afternoons watching these poor dolphins jump through hoops in a space which was probably from here to that side of the room. Now, nowadays, no one finds that ethically acceptable. In those days, we thought it was fabulous. And I was in a meeting last week when we were talking about farrowing crates for sows. And, and someone in that meeting said, you know, I think it's not going to be that long before we're looking back to this moment in time and thinking, how can we possibly have thought it was acceptable to keep pigs in that way? So things change over time. All of us need to be prepared to listen to other points a view and, and to challenge ourselves about whether actually the way in which we've done things is always the right way to do things, about whether what we're doing is ethically acceptable. Um, and to be prepared to accept those challenges. One of the great things about teaching um, is that I quite often get challenged by my own students uh, to think about the way in which I do things. And that applies to um, when I was in reproductive practice, applied um, to that quite often. And it's really good to have that challenge. And we need to be open to doing that. And we need to understand that talking about that is not a sign of weakness, quite the opposite, to be able to talk about things and to listen respectfully to challenges and then to consider them is actually a sign of strength. Um, and it will protect us as we go forwards. And then the language we use is important. So another thing I, I've been challenged by my own students on is I'm um, talking about farm animals, for example. They say, well, why are you calling the cow it? It's not it, it's she. Quite right, that pulled me up short. Um, I've tried throughout this talk, although it's a bit of a long uh, kind of not, you know thing to get out, but I, I've tried to talk about non-human animals rather than just about animals, because of course we are animals too. Um, you know, and we increasingly understand that. And so it's good to talk about non-human animals. One of the things we had a lot of discussion about as we were working on the FEI Commission was this idea of partnerships. Is there a horse-human partnership? Well, I don't think there is, personally. Um, that's my own personal view. But no, we, we interact with horses. Certainly we communicate with them. Those of us, and there are many of us, myself included in this room, who are with horses a lot, we know how special that relationship is, but it's not an equal partnership, really. You know, we put the tack on the horse, we tell it what we're going to do each day. And so personally, I think to use the term partnership is somewhat disingenuous, and I think it's unhelpful. And I think it's better to talk about an interaction or a relationship. And then there's the use of this word use, which I have very deliberately been using 
uh, throughout this talk. And, and again, that's something people can say, oh, you know, it's a bit of a challenging word. Why are you talking about use? Can't we find a different way of describing that? And again, I think it's disingenuous to try and describe it in a different way. Humans do use non-human animals and, and we need to be upfront about that, I think. And then we need to explain why we think that's ethically justifiable and the systems we have in place to protect welfare appropriately in order to make it ethically justifiable. The final point I wanted to finish up with, um, and it's interesting because Josh and I actually haven't compared what we we're going to speak about before we started, but I am about to end on almost the point on, on which he began um, by saying that the conversation we're having here today about the use of animals uh, in sport is actually not one we're having in a vacuum. It's one to do with a much larger societal conversation and consideration about uh, the interaction between humans and non-human animals and how all of those animals are part of the environment and the ecosystem. And, and Josh spoke very uh, well, and I agree with him about First Nations people and the, and the way in which they have been very aware of this forever and the way in which we are late to the game in, in our discussions. But it is a discussion that now is starting to happen. And this very nice uh, diagrammatic illustration of it was taken from the paper you can see here, which appropriately, um, given where we are, is actually about our animal welfare and, and bushfires. Um, but it, it just demonstrates, I think, how really it's all to do with one welfare. And that's the way I think in which we need to be thinking uh, as, as we go forward and have this conversation about our own particular uh, sectors. Finally, I couldn't finish having showed you a picture of my horses without showing you a picture of my greyhound. So this is my first retired greyhound, uh, Bertie. That's it. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Maddie, thank you very much. Uh, terrific as always and thought provoking. Some very important information there for the rest of the day. I think that point about one health, sorry, one welfare, I'm sorry, is key. And also the importance of trying to unpack some of these deceptively simple questions like, is it ethical? to use animals. I mean, that's a complicated yeah. question. So thank you. Now we've got time for, I think, two quick questions. Uh, Julie will bring the microphone around so our audience online can hear your question. Thanks, Dr. Campbell, for your presentation and um, agree with the engaging with, um, with people on this issue for sure. Um, I just had a question about, um, you made a comment about then being nothing ethically distinct about the use of animals in sport compared to other animal uses. Mm. And just wondering how that fits, you know, even with something like a utilitarian framework, um, we have risks and benefits uh, or you know, negative and positive welfare impacts, which differ between industries and even between different sports uses. Sure. So how do, how do those two marry up? So um, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is, is that, and I completely agree, of course, there are diff different harms and benefits across sports and, 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 and so forth, is that, that actually the harm, there are harms and benefits, whatever the use of, of humans. And, and the only example, really, in which I think um, the benefits are so substantial to humans that they would outweigh and do outweigh quite negative uh, welfare effects on non-human animals, albeit, of course, we try to minimise those, is when we're using animals in biomedical science. Um, but other than than that, there is, you know, we are always or very often uh, doing what Singer, of course, said we shouldn't do without thinking about it, which is allowing human interests to trump animal interests. And, and the point I'm making really is that we're not doing that uniquely when we're using animals in sport. We're doing it across uses of animals. Does, does that answer the question, or do you want to elaborate a bit more on your thinking on it? My name's Natalie Roadnight from RSPCA Australia. Um, so I guess um, the the level of harm and benefit is ethically relevant. So sure. so there is sure. ethically a difference between each animal use. I guess. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. The level of harm and benefit is is ethically relevant. Absolutely. And and then and this is. You know, there are some harms, and, and this is something actually and in, in, in other work I, I I do, we've been thinking about quite a lot. You know, there there may be some harms which are so severe, um, and, and that may be in terms of, of duration, or it may be just in terms of severity, that actually we don't find those ethically acceptable, whatever the benefit to humans would be. So to take one example of that, in, in uh, British policy, 
with a with a very specific exception in European legislation, we don't allow the use of great apes in biomedical research because our understanding of their cognitive ability is that the harms to them would be so great um, that however wonderful the benefit to humans might be of using them as experimental models, that's just not deemed acceptable. So I agree, it, it, it's a level of harm that's ethically relevant, yeah. Uh, Alan Youngman, Animal Office Science Centre. Um, I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about, you talked about um, the order of 23 hours, if we use an, a, a horse for one hour. But is that really, I mean, that's part of the lifestyle and part of that we should consider. We should consider the full 24 hours. But I don't think you should separate necessarily the 23 hours from the one hour that you use the animal. Okay. Correct? Like, as in... Whatever we do in that one hour, it may have a perfect life, 23 hours, but it doesn't doesn't mean that we shouldn't minimise the welfare impacts during that one hour. Oh, no, I agree with that completely. I could, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I was, I was almost, I think, thinking of the other way around, is, is there's no good only concentrating on that one hour and not worrying about the fact the horse is standing in the stable for the other 23. So, yeah, but, yeah, I could, we need to be thinking about it holistically, absolutely. We need to be trying to meet the animal's welfare needs throughout the 24 hours is, is because I mean, you, you gave a little bit the impression if we did if we did really well with the animal for 23 hours then oh then the one hour would matter no sorry that wasn't point. what i meant to say at all it was the opposite it was at doing i think the the focus um and certainly the media focus um you know and, and we think back to how influential that was on, in that world horse welfare survey about how people thought about things we think back to how in that example of the grand national is the fact people could suddenly see on television what was going on that made such a difference the media focus tends to be inevitably on the one hour you know when the horses are in the competitive arena um but it's it's the idea of iceberg indicators isn't it that's that's only the tip of the iceberg you know that's the visible bit but the 23 hours is the rest of the iceberg, as you know, that Christopher Watts has described under the water level, which is the rest of the animal's experience. So, yeah, if I gave that impression, that I meant it the other way around, and I, I apologize. Thank you. And Maddie, we do have one question online, which I'll take before we move on. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, so it relates to the uh, utilitarian calculation of a good life that you talked about and uh, the concept that uh, overall we need more positive experiences than negative and the question is um how much evidence is there that animals have these mental capacities and how can these be factored into the calculation about a good life and the question goes on to uh, ask whether actually the concept of a good life is one that makes it justifiable for us humans to make that reflection that the animal is is having a good life and I hope that helped did the question the justice, Chris, Christina. Thank you for the question. So um, I'm going to slightly pass that on to you because it's kind of what you're going to be talking about in a few minutes' time a, a little bit. But to answer the question in, in broad terms, where do we get that evidence from? I think we need to be looking um, as well as to welfare science, to behavioural science. And, and we have an increasing amount of evidence around that. And that is the perfect introduction <laughs> to uh, what I'm going to talk about. So here's another deceptively simple question. Can animals in sport have positive experiences? And we put this question in purposefully at this point because it's something we're going to think about a lot today. It's pretty central to the reason why we're here. And I don't think we have the answer to this question, but the purpose of this talk is to unpack a bit what this question actually means, what we need to know and what we need to be thinking about to answer it. And perhaps think about where we are at the moment in terms of being able to really answer this question and then taking that future focus, think about where next. But yes, Maddie's setup for this is perfect. It's thinking beyond our traditional science methods, which I'll explain are pretty limited when it comes to answering this question. Think about, okay, well, what else can we do to try to understand this question? Um, and I'm taking a high risk here. I thought we could... Uh, try some questions and uh, just get your views. So if you get your phones out and point it at that QR code, if the um, IT is with us, that should take you to a Mentimeter site, uh, which will open on your phone. It might take two or three seconds to open. And you'll be able to ans answer the question. So this is the kind of 
simplistic question that uh, Maddie was referring to with ethics. So can animals in sport have positive experience? And perhaps answer this from what you think the viewpoints and perspectives of the members of your organisation or sport participants think. It's the kind of question that uh, we'll think about the public in a second. It tends to get a sort of a gut feeling response from many people outside of the sector. Um, and I'd just be really interested to see what, what you think. So we've got yes all of the time, yes some of the time, sometimes or never. And this is all about perceptions because as I, said, I don't think we have a great way of actually measuring this at the moment. So pretty good consensus there. We're thinking that uh, yes, for some of the time. All right, well, thank you for that. Let's move on and ask the same question again. Your phones will update in just a second. What? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'll pause. I'll pause, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, apologies. How, how, how many people haven't been able to connect? Uh, a few of you. It, and is, is that because of s slow Wi-Fi connection? Okay. I'll hang on for, for, for a few, few seconds. Julie, have we distributed the guest Wi-Fi link? <laughs> As if by magic. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the um, username for the Wi-Fi, guest Wi-Fi is e-symposium, e-symposium, if you look on your Wi-Fi list, and the password for e-symposium is uh, at lowercase c, six, lowercase k, uppercase h, eight so at c six k uppercase h eight so just a quick question uh well okay so sometimes will be um occasionally you know generally not perhaps is there a wife giving us something not true Yes, so if, if you go to menti.com and then put in the code that's at the top of the screen, uh, 3322 These things never quite go according to plan. <laughs> but at least some of you have been able to join. And again, um, we have some evidence about what the public think, and that is um slides which would be principally uk audience i would guess or would they be an international audience international well, international yeah yeah so you know there is a difference in between what we believe and what the public can believe um i'm sure as you're saying here now that um the uh some of the public will be are thinking the same things as us, but we know some of the public are definitely not thinking the same things as us. So that's relevant for thinking about that future focus for later. Um, now let's just try some other other ideas. Um, I would be keen to get your views about what we think the public view is about horses in sport at their home stable or yard. So away from competition, so away from the racetrack or the event or where, wherever it is what what do we think so again apologies if i've not chosen great words but yes most are all the time yes sometimes seldom or rarely or actually we're not sure the public really worry about the horse's experience out of the public eyes it were out of the um tv um so when the horse is back at the home stable yard yeah so I think that that's interesting. Uh, that would be my view too. I think for horses, I'm not sure that the public give a huge amount of thought to what happens outside of the um, public eye in competition. So thank you for that. Now, what about this one? How about if we think about um, 
racing greyhounds. And apologies to the sled dog community. I've not put a question in about sled dogs, but uh, what about what do the public think about positive experience for racing greyhounds at the home kennel? It's interesting to think about, isn't it? So if I just go back a slide, then here's what we thought for horses at home. And positive, and actually maybe a lot of people don't really think about this, but our view for greyhounds at home is somewhat different. And and that's what I think I would have, I mean, Maddie's the expert, but uh, you know, I think, one, I think in some moments in time, there is a, a media event which makes people suddenly think about a training method, for example, being used outside of competition, but generally speaking, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So again, worth thinking about, we take our future focus and to take that view across our sports. What do we need to think about at competition and also out of competition? And then the last thing, um, so you can type word words in here, and I think that um, to start to understand the question a bit more, can animals have positive experience? We actually need some underpinning knowledge or assumptions. Back to Maddie's question about ethics, you can't, we can't answer this and we can't let the public de debate be a matter of emotion or gut reaction. So perhaps just think about, if we're gonna really engage with this question, thinking about mental states, and that's what we mean by positive experience, mental states, what underpinning knowledge or assumptions do we need to have or be thinking about or using to really start to understand what this question requires? Yep, brilliant. Keep going. I like all of these. So measures of stress, absolutely. We'll talk about that. Acceptable thresholds, yes, key concepts. Uh, frameworks for assessment. Thank you for putting that one in. Um, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later. Behavioural indications. Know how animals show they're having a positive e experience. And that's a great one. If, if the person that contributed to that is comfortable, could you say more about a little bit more about how we might know the animals? Have, what, you know, how could we? Um, thank you. My name's um, Stella and I'm from Racing Victoria. When I've written that down there, it's a, if I think about, you know, we explain that they do, we've got to think about, well, how do we know that? And that yes. comes through behavioral science. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, as Maddie had set up, set up for us. So we need means of observing the animal and then making inferences about what do we think that behavior means? And do we think that indicates a, a positive um, experience, a, pontal, a, a positive um mental state minimal standards absolutely reading body language very much uh, along the lines with you physiological assessments yes and that's where we have been and i'd like to think about the pros and cons or the limitations and advantages of phys physiological assessments another framework reference five domains changes in, in in behavior mental health needs what a happy animal actually looks like now, I love that whoever cooked like this used the word happy. It's not many years ago when it would have been, I think, scientifically unacceptable to talk about happy. We'd use other words. But actually, we're sort of moving on, and you'll come across this idea of, in thinking about this, we need to bridge from our traditional quantitative science base. We can measure things, we can observe things, and perhaps take that leap of faith into the more qualitative world and um, think of things a little bit differently. Now, now that's a stretch and it does cause some tension in animal science, but this is what, so you've absolutely nailed it there. Thank, thank you, we'll hang on to that slide. So um, I'll just say a few words and then I'll wrap up. Now, in fact, as you've touched on, we cannot think about positive experience unless we have an understanding of and an acceptance of animal sentience and agency. Julie's gonna to touch on those in her talk. 
a little bit. And we also need, importantly, not just to understand this and accept it, but a willingness to adopt practices that recognize both of these. And if you think about it, the previous concepts of welfare and uh, we had contributions from about five domains. What was the sort of framework that you'd have probably worked in uh, pre five domains? Five oh, freedoms, right. Served us well, and I'll say a few words about that. Served us well, but we need, and we have move, moved on. So we need to move on from those sort of five freedom based concepts of welfare. It's really focused on physical health, ability to cope with the environment, and minimizing negative effects, negative experiences, which actually are really survival critical things. Thirst, hunger, temperature, that sort of thing. And as Maddie introduced very nicely, current concepts are really all about recognizing that animals firstly as sentience, and because of that are capable of experiencing positive and negative emotions and experiences or effects. And the big shift in recent years has been recognizing that when we talk about a good life, which we still don't really have a tight definition for, and I think the question from Christina side to unpack that a little bit, but whatever we end up landing on for what a good life means, it cannot be achieved simply by avoiding negative experiences. That's not enough. We actually moved, need to shift, and many of you in the room have already made this shift, to thinking about, okay, well, what can we do to provide the animal with mainly positive experiences through its life. And here's words again, we would not have used until recently, pleasure, reward, achievement, happiness. And so really when we think about what we're doing on the ground, our practices need to shift and are shifting from care, meaning how we manage the horse, its environment, its feed and so on, to doing that, but also promoting its psychological well-being, because that's what we mean by positive mental states, experiences, or effects. They're all really interchangeable ideas. Oh, sorry, on the wrong, wrong, wrong computer there. Now we've took, we'll skip over, over that one. Um, so we talked about the five freedoms, great model introduced in the 1990s. It served us very well. It moved animal welfare onto a, a platform where we could actually think about it in, 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 in clear terms. What it really does, though, is focus on um, minimizing, rather than eliminating, but mi minimizing the survival critical negative experience, hunger, thirst, pain, injury, disease, fear, distress, dis discomfort, and so on. What it doesn't do is think about the animal's external experiences, how they impact its mental state. So that really means its interactions interactions with other animals, interactions with people, interactions with the environment. And we're all familiar with the five domains model. And of course, that's exactly what the five domains model does. It recognizes that uh, nutrition, environment, health, which are those survival critical re requirements, are important. We also need then to think about the external influences on the animal's mental state, its behavioral interactions with other animals with people and its environment. And that all of these result in the end point mental state, and it's the mental state which is welfare. And I think this graphic from World Horse Welfare shows this very nicely. There's lots of ways of rep representing this, but this is the big shift. So the key thing is this idea of behavioural interactions. This is really the big thing which the five domains in, in, introduced. We've talked about agency, and the key thing with behavioural interactions, as we've had from, from you in the audience, is that this is the animal's opportunity to exercise agency. It's opportunity to make conscious choices and do things in order to achieve a goal. And agency is key in this thinking about how do we think about mental experience because agency is the gateway for assessing and understanding positive welfare. And why is that? Well, it's because if we know what we're looking at and we need the tools to actually do this in a repeatable way, but if we know what we're looking at, then the animal's positive or negative emotions can be inferred from what we observe 
it doing, its agency-related behaviours, and what we think that means. And so actually agency provides a way of assessing positive mental experience. There may be other ways too, but this is a really important way. And it's a big, big move on for science from thinking about physiological measures, heart rate, body weight, appetite, food intake, cortisol, all those things that, that we used to. This is a different way of thinking. Um, I won't go through all these, but I just copied out two of the um, very nice examples from David Mellor's Five Domains paper. You'll all be familiar with this, but this is the sort of thinking we need, where on the left we've got examples of um, what we do, to, which will either allow or not allow agency, and then how that might uh, produce negative experiences in red, or positive experiences on the right. So, for example, being in a barren, boring environment creates boredom, helplessness, de depression and withdrawal, whereas a varied novel environment creates an interested animal which is pleasantly occupied. Or animals which have, are facing significant threats will have anxiety um, and fear and anger, whereas re removing those will produce a sense of being secure, protected and confident. And perhaps more relevant for us now are interactions with humans because that's what we do in sport. And so here's some examples, and I won't read them out again, but again, some thoughts from David about the, the kind of um, interactions that animals might have with us, how we behave around them that can result in negative um, outcomes and those that can result in positive outcomes. Now we're talking about sport, so let's think about what, what could this mean for us? What could this mean for training methods? What could this mean for competition? And this is where incorporating another relatively new discipline, animal learning theory, becomes so important because we know a lot now about what animals learn and how they respond mentally when they're learning. So maybe it's time to start thinking, and many of you are, about positive reinforcement methods during training, making training a positive learning exercise. Animals like to learn. Horses love to acquire new skills, new competencies. Let's make learning a cognitive ac ac activity which produces mental re uh, uh, rewards. Lots of things we can be thinking about. It's, we're doing it in small ways, but this, when we get to the workshop this afternoon, this is really the kind of things that we need to be um, th thinking about. So two more slides, then I'll stop. So the problem with all of this which is really at the root of Christina's question online, is that we can't measure mental experience. I can't measure your mental experience. You can tell me about it. I can't measure a horse or a dog's mental experience, and they can't tell us uh, about it. And that's because they're felt by that individual animal. They're unique to that animal. They're sub subjective. But what we can do using, say, behavioural measures, and maybe other measures in the future, looking at what the animal's doing, we can maybe cautiously infer what we think that behavior means. And does this indicate a positive or negative state? And so there's lots of um, welfare indicators that we have used. Um, that traditionally we thought about, okay, how adequate are the resources we're providing, food, water, shelter, how adequate are ma management and training practices? We've got animal-based measures, physiology, which actually are very limited and really tell us only about negative states, things like cortisol, heart rate. Behavioral measures, and that's all about agency, which I think give the opportunity to think about mental states and positive experiences. And a bit for the future, maybe there's biomarkers, maybe there's things we can measure in blood. We all know about oxytocin, that's the pleasure hormone, the feel-good hormone. Maybe there's an opportunity there. And there's a growing field of measuring brain-related chemicals in blood that maybe in the future might give us some more objective measures. But right now, it's all about behavioral measures and thinking about agency. And we've got a number of these, of course, which are well in use, things like qualitative behavioral assessments and the animal welfare uh, indicator tools, which many of you will be familiar with and use. So I'm going to stop at this point and just summarize by saying that this is a complicated but decept deceptively simple question 
To engage with this, we need an underpinning acceptance and understanding of sentience and agency. And it also requires a fundamental shift in thinking from five freedoms to five domains. And the fact that um, a good welfare state means an overall positive mental state. And this means how the animal experiences their life. And this is not just about minimizing negative experience. It's about providing opportunities for positive mental experiences. And it is the case that assessing or measuring positive mental states is a challenge, but we do have some tools which are now becoming validated and accepted, and we're starting to use them. And so now we can start to think a bit better about what, what a good life means, but we still are not able to really agree the methods to quantify it. And so we started with this question, can animals in sport have positive experience? Now, my proposition for today is that we reframe this question to this. Rather than that simple question, can animals in sport have positive experience? I think the question is, how can we, and you as leaders, embed sentience-informed and agency-enabling environmental management and training or competition practices into our sports disciplines and sectors? And that's quite a big one to think about. And how can we assess this and provide evidence that we are providing opportunities for a net positive experience for our animals? And so I'll stop at that point. And I hope that's a useful setup for what's to follow. And I'm now going to hand on to my colleague, Julie Fiedler, who's been working with me on a PhD project, actually looking at many of these questions. Um, oh. <laughs> Thank you, you're very kind. Um, Christina, um, you're welcome to come online and uh, speak because um, I, I hope I've not, um, uh, not misrepresented your question. So you're very welcome to join us. Oh, thank you so much, Josh. I just wanted, uh, um, I'll ask my question when um, at the panel during the panel if that's okay because I, I don't want to detract from the um from the wonderful presentations thank you please please do and as i say I, I personally i think your question is very helpful because it, it is unpacking this this complexity that, that that we have but yes do bring that up during the questions okay well thank you again i'll hand over to julie fiedler she'll be well known to many of you she's a well-known figure in the uh, Australian uh, horse um, areas, having served with uh, Horse SA for 20 years. And Julie's been working with me for the last four years on many of the questions that we're looking at today, in particular this idea of a future focus for horse welfare. So Julie, thank you for talking and over to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming many thousands of miles, some of you guys. It's really great to have you here today. Um, I'll just do a very short uh, presentation, mainly because it's coffee break soon, but also um, it's just really to bring some ideas forward that we'd love for you to have a bit more of a chat about this afternoon. So as uh, Josh mentioned eloquently in his opening, <laughs> um, I also always acknowledge because my project is about sentience and agency that this knowledge sits um, very deeply within many First Nations cultures and is coming quite late um, to Westernised cultures. Uh, two quick items, but Maddie has covered off on social licence to operate, so that will be um, a very short talk, and then uh, I'll go on to safeguarding. Um, one reason that brings us to the room today is that there is um, a change in public attitude. We can feel it. We can bring out newspapers and magazines from two years ago and then what's headlines back then is very different to what's headlines today and the speed of those headlines going viral. So, and one of those things is because more people or the public understand that animals can think and feel, so they're sentient and that brings with it expectations for care. 
Now, the Victorian government um, has responded and is bringing sentience into law in Victoria, and you've got until the 25th of March <laughs> to uh, respond to that. I'll get to that slide. But also I saw on my feed the other day South Australia is going to introduce a bill for the same thing, so that won't take long to move around the country. And the other thing is um, with social licence is the idea of public trust. The public needs to trust people and organisations that good well-being or welfare will take place even when nobody is looking. So as Josh mentioned, um, I've just pulled one quote from thousands of quotes <laughs> that have uh, come through the Future Horse Project. But this person, um, respondent, realises that all social licence affects the way we approach how horses are prepared and cared for. That includes the stable staff, the trainers, the stewards. Everybody has to work as a team. And even in a, in a meeting yesterday that I was in um, with, with Karen, we were look, heard about how all the organisations that are being set up, it's a new national framework for vocational training and workforce, all organisations have to help other organisations meet a standard. If one organisation falls down or is not perceived to be meeting a standard, the public thinks it's all the others as well. Okay, so we have to work together to collectively um, hold our standards up. So um, social licence, as Maddie's, uh, it's tr pointed out, so it's trust credibility and legitimacy, but we've got some really good authors in the room that have written papers on this, so we won't spend too long there. Um, that was the Adelaide International three-day event, but absolutely classic photo. So, <laughs> so people are no longer opening up the newspaper and reading the news. They are, we are all newsmakers. If you post something on Facebook, you are a newsmaker. Okay. And then that news, in its new form, can be traded. Who knows who, who saw what? Did you see this? Okay, it's traded like currency. It has value. So um, the other another talk I do, I often call, talk about a digital hoof print because whatever you, photo is taken, whether the horse is looking brilliant or the horse is not, not looking so brilliant, it's online forever. Okay. So it's just keeping that in the back of your mind. Um, probably an important point for many of the regulatory uh, delegates in the room today, another thing that's changed probably is some of the pressure you might feel about decision-making in, in public space because those decisions are judged online in real time um, as well as by people that might be there on the ground. Okay, so I call it decision making in the company of the public, the real and the virtual public. So there's a very high risk for a misalignment, misalignment between um, the intent of the veterinarian and, and, as Maddie said, to make animal welfare decisions and what the public's thinking of those forces going around the jump. Good photo. But importantly, social licence is a concept that rests with the public, okay? We have the responsibility for animal welfare and wellbeing and working with our stakeholders and other organisations to do that. Okay, so just for a few minutes before we go for a break, we'll just have a talk about the concept of safeguarding. Now, it's one of these words that's used in lots of different ways. Um, and there's also a legal versions of the word as well. So what I'm proposing is that animal organisations start thinking about what does safeguarding mean for us, okay, in our world? What does it mean in, in, the, like, in the world of sports? Now, we're all used to the idea of child safeguarding in sports and British Equestrian got quite a nice page on that. Don't look too far for it. Um, but it's any person in the community that might not be able to advocate for themselves. So we've had a Royal Commission into Disability in Australia. Okay. Or aged care homes, another situation. So it's anywhere that humans can't advocate for themselves, um, that humans take a safeguarding approach. Now, children in sports, an easy, easy one. 
But it's the same with horses. I'll walk around the university here last year and I saw safeguarding our national dairy herd. I'm like, ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> um, so same principles. But how we, how are we going to apply that for animals in sport? We're taking animals into situations that are outside of their home environment. So um, giving Victorian government a plug here. <laughs> so um, you have a few more days to have a think about what it might mean for animal sentience in law coming into the big Victoria, but as I also saw online the other night, South Australia won't be far behind. It is having a look at more than minimum legal requirements. Um, and in the consultation documents, if they're still online, if you go back, have a look, the concept of sentience and safeguarding are connected, connected in a legal sense. And I would encourage everybody to think, well, what does it mean in a community sense? What does it mean for us in a broader context? We don't want to be in legal, live in a legal co co corridor. So um, moving on quickly to, well, Josh has covered this. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, mate, very quick. Um, so we've traditionally spent all of our life on the health, nutrition, physical environment. Okay, that's all farm animal welfare is long history in that. And that's where the five freedoms came out of is, is farm animal intensive management and the five domains brings to us this behavioral interactions and it brings to us situation related experiences so situations interactions and if this comes from the social sciences situated experiences are well embedded so it's the interaction of people with other people sort of thing so it's so it's understanding that those experiences can either be internal or innate or something i'm thirsty okay the animal doesn't have much control over that but they will have some control over their situation or how they interact with you okay um so i've had this drawn up <laughs> just to keep you thinking um, I did start this originally josh might have saw an early version i had lines going everywhere <laughs> just got too much Really, it's just to um, be a discussion point and it's a lovely picture to have in a workshop and get people to t start talking about, well, I've taken my horse out of the home environment. How many more people, how many different experiences, what am I asking them to do in a very short time? Step out the float, put the saddle on, let's perform. That is almost no ad adaptation time. Can't think of any other species that would have to do the same thing. Just keep dog people happy. <laughs> okay, similar thing for greyhounds. So any um, sport can create or draw up your own sort of similar exercises. And it helps thinking because thinking is so entrenched in the home stable environment. Most research to date has been in the animal's living environment very little research out on the sporting field, okay, and out on the track that is to do with human-animal interaction, okay. So just coming towards the safety net, so there are, what I would like to get across today is that there's more than one person, e.g. the animal's owner, that is responsible for how that animal experiences that event. So we're traditionally taught to think, well, that person's responsible for that animal and they should make it stand still and do whatever, <laughs> okay? But we need to move on from that and think, well, as event organisers, as other people at the event, uh, we all have a responsibility towards every animal that's there. Now, we can have a responsibility in person, but also as part of the wider safety net, um, and, and you're into bedtime reading, have a think about the different acts and policies and codes, which may be voluntary or mandatory, that also indirectly impact how that animal may, may feel or may experience that event. Now, that is a whole day workshop just on that slide. But that's, I think, again, just thinking about how do we join up 
and work together to make sure every animal experiences that event uh, positively. So I've just put that together quickly into something called Animal Safeguarding for Organisations. I just read the human side of things, had a look at some keywords, had a look at the work I was doing, the PhD project, chats with Josh, um, and um, came up with these kind of headings. But there are examples, and different organisations may choose to have their own. Uh, culture is quite important because it's an enabler. You can have all the policies and rule books in the world, but unless culture is positive, it's a, it, um, rules will be avoided, ignored, or tokenistic. It'll be hard work for the people that have to enforce the rules. So culture is really important. I'm hoping you can read because I'm not going to read it all out. Okay, um, but it is being recorded. And you're welcome to go back and have a look. So Josh has covered off on the five domains, fortunately. Maddie's already touched on language. Um, it's important that we don't objectify animals. But also, too, there's sometimes this silence, which could be um, also cause its own problems. Proportionate. Anybody that's had to run a budget will be right on top of this. <laughs> okay. But it's important to understand that it's not only fiscal decision making that's sitting behind why your event or why you've chosen to do one thing over another. It's part of what Maddie was talking about today. Understand the why. Okay. And one I always bring up with Josh is the biosecurity one because so it's all about isolating the horse. Keep horses apart. For the herd health and that's fine. Biosecurity expert over there as well. <laughs> um, but our activities have developed over the years. And have we thought about how we can introduce, how we can have some sort of social engagement for the animals in a high health status? Okay. Our venues are not they're sold at, you know, sold as really good dressage arenas top surface on the racetrack, wouldn't it be great if we had, like, as well as five-star dressage arena, we had five-star social engagement equipment or things that you, you could take your horse and have some could rub and scratch because there's 23 hours in the stable. And that's infrastructure. That's an easy thing to do, okay? But our venues are not designed like that. We haven't thought like that. But that's just one option. Okay, collaborative care. We'll hopefully have a lot more chat about that this afternoon. Um, but that's together we're working, together we're decision-making, and you'll hear a bit more about that on the panel. And then we must be solution-orientated. It's not about avoiding suffering and cruelty. It's what can we do to provide positive experiences? What are the solutions? How do we implement it? And please celebrate tiny successes because they're so hard to bring forward in organisations sometimes. And accountability. There's plenty of stewards in the room today, so um, you'll be right across that one. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Brilliant follow-on from uh, Maddie's talk. Great link into mine and very much that future focus and uh, the idea of safeguarding is one of the, the sort of future ideas that we really want to explore a bit more during the later sessions. So, Julie, uh, you brought us perfectly to time. Thank you. Um, are there any questions that we can answer to make this morning's session uh, more complete before we go into the short coffee break and then come back for the panel? Uh, yeah, uh, let's go to... Um, First, then we'll come back to you, Alan. Uh, no, we'll, we'll we'll go to Graham first. Graham just had his hand up ahead of Alan. <laughs> yeah. Um, Graham, I, I was a director of the NPI, and then I was on the board of a horse charity. But, uh, I'm currently a CEO of Um, it's a question for you all. Uh, when I was 
doing the FBI role, I was always amazed at the different cultures in different parts of the world. So one part of the world, we would do whatever you have to do with the horse, put the horses on the team, even though on the other side, it seemed to be that mental practices. And another side, uh, uh, Holland or Germany, if you have to do anything to the horse, it's akin to uh, child abuse, because the horse is a child. And in other parts of the world, uh, the horse was a gift from God, and therefore, there was a time to do as you wish to be on criticism uh, to any animal. So, you talked about culture, and I really value your own opinions on that in terms of some of the ideas. That... Yeah, brilliant question. I'll ask Marty to lead off on that. Just a personal thought. Um, we're all of like mind, I think, in this call, both in the room and online, but we're about thinking internationally here, and that is such an important contextual question for us. But Maddie, um, no, you... I, I agree with what you just said as, as well, and 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 Graham's absolutely right. It is a challenge, and and I I was aware yeah. of that when I was sitting on the FEI commission as well. Um, and in in fact, that the awareness of that challenge is very that is driven collaboration um, and that actually one of the reasons for having this event today is is hoping that you in this room will go back to your organisation different, and different sectors and will be able to act as leaders in, in helping to engage more and more people in this conversation. And one of the things I hope we'll be able to do will be identify people all across the world who can take on that leadership role. Right, and uh, I think we should unpack that a little bit more um, as the day goes on. Key question. Uh, we'll take the last question from Ellen and then we'll go for a well-earned coffee break. Yeah, probably more more comment than necessarily a question. Um, I'm, I know we're all enthusiastic now about including positive emotions and positive experience for animals. But I think particularly when we look at animals in sport, there are still a lot of negative things, like even Julie showing up, you know, animals coming out of in a novel environment, exposed to so many things. And then you're talking about some brushes to make it a positive experience. You've got to be a little bit careful that we don't overstate the positive experiences. And, and, and as long as there are still a lot of negative experiences, I think that's still where the main focus should be. And the positive experiences really come in, you know, yeah. as, as a mind. I think that's a good comment. So we need to keep a focus on that. And um, as I touched on this really about thinking, what more can we do? What can we do differently for the future? And actually, uh, that's another very complex idea, of course, because we have embedded within that the idea of an animal's resilience to cope with temporary and the negative experiences and what that looks like in different species and different areas. So again, another complicated idea, but absolutely, you know, we, we need to, although we are taking a positive future focus here, there's still work that we need to fix up to deal with some of the negative aspects. Julie highlighted those very well. Great question. Thank you. We're going to stop there and uh, go for a quick coffee break. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, a quick break, but we'd like to get started with the next session. Uh, we're going into the panel. By way of wrap-up from uh, this morning's talks, we have a short video from World Horse Welfare, uh, which sets out uh, some more detail about social license to operate. So we'll play that now, and then we'll go into the panel. For almost 100 years, World Horse Welfare has been improving welfare within the Horse-Human Partnership through care, research, education, and influence. We help horses in need, horses in work and production, and horses in sport and leisure. World Horse Welfare supports the ethical use of horses in sport and is a critical friend of horse sport industries. We are an independent welfare advisor to the FEI and British Horse Racing Authority and offer advice to other national federations. But increasingly, public acceptance of the involvement of horses in sport is under growing scrutiny. Society is suspicious of the use of animals in entertainment. They're worried about how horses are bred, cared for, trained, competed, and what happens to them when their careers are over. 
horse sport social license to operate is increasingly being challenged. At the same time, our knowledge of what horses need to have good welfare and a good life is expanding. Many in the horse world now understand that some traditional practices must change and they don't like aspects of what they see in horse sport. Horse sport has been tackling this head on and regulators and others have moved forward with initiatives to improve practices and perceptions of the welfare of horses in sport. But what progress has been made and are they moving fast enough? Today we will explore how horse sport is working to strengthen their social license and whether they are taking the public with them. Thanks, Diana. Right, let's move into the panel session. So if I could invite our panelists to come down and take a seat at the front. Um, we'll, we'll leave the Zoom running. Um, I appreciate for those of you online, this might not be quite as interactive as it will be for the people in the room, but you'll be able to hear the conversation, I think. We'll have one roving mic for the panel, and then we'll take one roving mic around the uh, room. Um, the way we're going to run this, we've got about 40 minutes and um, I'll introduce the panel first. We've um, got uh, three sort of setting up questions, sort of icebreaker questions, which I'll ask the panel and then it's over to you. Uh, and please ask any questions that you would like to. So let me introduce the panel. Um, absolutely thrilled that you've uh, been able to come here and some of you have come from literally the other side of the world and are coping incredibly well with jet lag so ha ha hats off to you um, but th thank you for joining and you'll see as I do the introductions that the panel is um, absolutely representative of of what we're trying to achieve here very broad range of expertise across uh, the equine and the canine sector and different disciplines so let me start with Janet Douglas who's sitting closest to me um, Janet's an equine practitioner from the UK. She wears several hats. One of those hats is that she works for World Horse Welfare, uh, one of the UK's large uh, horse charities in a research and education role. Uh, also highly influential, promoting uh, improvements in welfare in racing and sport, and an expert on SLO and the communication about SLO. And importantly for this panel, not only does Janet do all of that, but she's also highly connected into the grassroots of horse sports in the UK through the UK Pony Club. Sitting next to Janet is Michelle Ledger. Really pleased to have Mich Michelle on the panel because she has a unique blend of experience. She's a regulatory veterinarian uh, with experience in both the equine and greyhound sectors. Very few people have that. Um, she's the welfare manager for Greyhound Racing New Zealand and is the president of the Greyhound Working and Sports Dogs Veterinary Association. Close. <laughs> Someone with also that unique blend of experience is sitting next to Michelle, Maddie Campbell, who you've met earlier. Um, I think Maddie probably doesn't need for further introduction, but just to say again, Maddie has that breadth of experience across uh, horse and dog sports. Sitting next to Maddie is Janet Horton. Janet, welcome. Janet is the Chair of Eventing Australia and Director of the Melbourne International Three-Day Event. Uh, she also manages the Victorian Eventing Squad Programme. And at the end, sitting next to Janet, is Grace Forbes, who will be known to many of you. Grace is uh, an important figure in Victoria and in Australia, and internationally, she's the General Manager of Veterinary Services for Racing Victoria. So, panel, thank you for joining us. Great to have you. Let me ask the first question. Um, we've been introduced to the concept of safeguarding uh, during the talks uh, earlier, and this is well established as in human sport as a means of protecting the well-being of anyone in sport who can't or does not feel able to advocate for themselves. Michelle, could you give us some examples of what safeguarding looks like in human sport and perhaps your thoughts on how those principles could be translated into our animal sports? 
Yeah, thanks, Josh. I think um, Julie did this justice earlier, but certainly it's well established in human sports, this concept of safeguard. And if we have a look at the Australian Sports um, the Integrity Commission and, and other well established organizations, they have policies and, and frameworks and these things are well embedded from grassroots all the way through to elite sports. So it's really about ensuring that children who take part in sport can do so in a safe way that's protected and they're protected by everyone that has a touch point with those sports. And that would include the coaches, the volunteers, um, and and everybody associated, uh, referees, clubs, and, and all the stakeholders associated with those sports. So their policies would start, for example, with your working with children's checks that everybody has to have in order to partake in those sports, uh, to mandatory reporting, and then um, going up to the elite sports, the anti-doping protocols and everything else in order to keep uh, children and athletes safe. Uh, and the whole idea is that children can come and partake in these sports without threat of harm. So the harms can be physical in terms of injury or overexertion, or they can be um, psychological harms associated with, you know, abuse or um, often like we talked about pushy parents, right? We're talking about what is the role of pushy parents and, and pushing these athletes too hard too soon. And if we think about our horse sports, particularly, we can think about our owners often as, as those pushy parents sometimes. Um, so you and are you seeing some of those principles being applied in our animal sports already, or do we have quite some way to go before we get to that equivalent state? I think the equivalence is still a little way off, and that's part of the workshop that we'll work on later is the future state for, for all of our sports. But I think in terms of the regulatory side of things, you know, I, I don't think there's a single regulatory organization that I've spoken to that is solely focused on minimizing harm. Um, to animals and, and improving safety and, and really focused on that welfare aspect. So um, I think we've got the, the rules policy side of things really well embedded and the way we run our events is, is with safety and welfare top of mind. But in incorporating all of the stakeholders and touch points with those animals, I think that's the future step. Great perspective. And as you say, that's very much what we want to look at a bit later on. Let's talk about this concept of shared responsibility for the well-being of our animals in sport. If you think about any of your sectors, you've got very visible, very clearly identified um, key stakeholders. Those people are very much in the spotlight for um, thinking about and delivering welfare. So that would be the regulatory bodies. Uh, vets would be a, another uh, key group and technical delegates and so on. But as we've heard, well-being should be a shared or collective responsibility for everybody. And Julie summarised that very nicely. Maddie, can you tell us about the work you've been involved with to promote this concept of shared responsibility and safeguarding? Yeah, I think Julie hit the nail on the head when, when she said earlier, and it fits with exactly what Michelle just said about, you know, the rules and the regulations that were already there. But, and you know, if they're only being enforced or attempted at enforcing it from the top down, um, it doesn't have the impact it, it needs to have. And, and, you know, it's all about driving human behavior change, which has become a very current topic at, at the moment. And, you know, really getting everyone to adopt that responsibility for safe regarding is that is, you know, in a school situation, I work sometimes in a school situation, and, you know, everyone knows that they personally are responsible for safeguarding, whether they're the person, you know, providing the meals or whoever, and, and it's much the same. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that's certainly how we've been looking at things from the Greyhound perspective in the UK. Um, and it, it's something that actually it's been really encouraging to me to see um, how all internal stakeholders across the sport of Greyhound racing in the UK have genuinely understood that welfare is their own personal responsibility and, and have, have taken on that mantle of being prepared to identify what they think is poor welfare practice by other individuals and to call that out. And I think that's really important. And presumably that required quite a, a change in mindset, how people think and... Uh, actually less than I expected oh. in, in a way. So, so one of the interesting things when I, when I came in to work on the welfare strategy for the Greyhound board as a, an outsider who had some experience in, in Greyhound, 
uh, racing, but you know, independent of, of the organization and the sport was they were already doing a lot of good stuff, but they weren't talking about it very much. Yeah. And I think that was partly because they were anxious about what happened if they started to talk about this stuff at all in the public domain. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier, but I think we really need to talk about what we're doing. Right. That is such a great point, isn't it? Because actually we're doing a lot of this already. And I think many groups are very good at communicating it, but I think in general, we could, yeah, there's, there's an anxiety about opening up. And so that's something else we can very much think about this, 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 this afternoon. Reassuring that the change perhaps wasn't quite as big as you might have thought. No, it, it was, it didn't, I mean, it was, they did it, you know, it was there. The, the desire to do it was genuine and was already there. Because a lot of what we're talking about here today is about change. And I wonder what you think the general mood across our industries is. There's already been quite a lot of change and there's this sort of threat of change over the horizon all the time. Uh, I'd love to hear from you how much change you feel there's been in your respective industries and how the industry feels about it. Are people sort of um, uh, fatigued by that change? Um, Michelle, would you like to lead off on this? Because I know you've got some direct experience. Yeah, I think... Um... If I think about the New Zealand context specifically, where they've been under sort of a government review and a threat of closure for for a number of years, and so there has been um, a lot of change management. Um, and like many reflected, you know, I think there's been a willingness to embrace those changes and to move forward with those changes across the industry. And there's been a lot of uh, regulatory change in terms of rules, policies, uh, procedures, and and things across the board. But I think they we have to be careful about accelerating change at a pace that exceeds the ability of the industry um, to actually move with it or to embrace it. Um, and I think for a lot of industry participants, social license in itself is not a great reward or motivator um, necessarily. Now, they're all concerned, obviously, with their animals and the welfare of their animals, and that in itself um, is an important driver. But as we heard earlier, the ethical views don't necessarily, you know, of, of racing and social license don't necessarily um, reflect the welfare status of those animals from an internal yeah. perspective. Yeah. I like that point about, so Grace, Grace and I talked about this very point uh, a week ago. And although we focused on SLO, we were talking about whether actually that is the end point we're looking at or whether we're looking for something else beyond SLO. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I think one quick thing I'd just say on the with a comment on change and how our industry participants, at least in our industry, have accepted change. I mean, we've had a pretty steady rate of change over a long period of time, and that has the benefits that um, Michelle alluded to in trying to have that incremental change. But I do think every now and then something happens that requires some like a really significant change. And that can be really challenging for our participants to uh, accept. Um, and I think the good example we had were the, the changes we put in place for the Melbourne Cup. They were seen as being quite strict and oppressive. Um, and definitely in the first years that we introduced them, the feedback we got from our industry participants was we understand why you're doing it, but you're making it too hard for us. Um, and now three years down the track, we are definitely much accepting of that uh, going to your question now i think yeah social license to operate is a tricky one and i think i probably put it a little bit akin to climate change i mean if you say to everyone do you want to um do you value the environment do you want to um protect the oceans protect endangered species they'd say yes but climate change is not a particularly sexy word anymore and it's almost kind of there's a bit of animosity around it and social license to operate i think at least is sort of seems a bit too uh, obscure or it's not something you can reach out and touch. And I know there's there's been a bit of a focus in our industry, horse racing at least, looking at sustainability, like how can we sustain our industry and maintain the sort of social acceptability of our industry. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective. Thank you. Now, the last question we wanted just to in, introduce, we did touch on during some of the talks, which is what we understand and what other people understand by concepts such as good welfare or a good life. We all use them, 
but uh, we'd like to unpack a little bit with the panel what you think um, your stakeholders currently understand by good welfare or good well-being or a good life. They're all they're all aspirational terms. We have a sort of instinctive feel for what we think that means. But I'd love to hear more about what you're seeing on on the on the ground and what this. Um, looks like and feels like whether there's consensus or not and uh, what people are doing to start to assess it and i'd love for uh janet and janet to uh, give us some ideas on that <laughs> um i think you had it up there before i think in in our sport in equestrian it is um how they're cared for how they're maintained i think you know health care all of that sort of stuff where they live um i think we are getting more Someone talked about being used and not being that user friendly. I think we are getting more. The stables we're building now don't have a dividing wall where you can't see another horse. The stables we're building now, they can, they can see each other and they are social animals. So that we're trying a bit like at Werribee when we have an event, you talked about um, positives for the horses. They all go out and have a pick of grass on the, on the, and, and, you know, the grooms all have a chat and the horses have a pick and go for a walk. So, um, probably the thing that I think in our in our sport needs to be looked at is we need to make sure always that the horse is competing at the level that it's educated in and confident in. And obviously when um, I'm not so much a dressage person, it's more jumping for me, but for me, I want to see a horse that's confident at the level it's competing. And I think it's an old picture when, you, when you've got a horse out there that um, is not so that's very much a part of their welfare is that, that they're um, competing at the level that they're confidently training at. Mm -hmm. um, but it is interesting because I think communication is absolutely the key. I was just thinking earlier, when you were talking about the 23 hours, I actually, I got that. I got that you were saying that that's what we've got to look at and say, is that is that good for the horse? And yet, Another person in the audience took it completely the other way, and that's where communication and making things where things can be picked up, especially if it's online or something, and taken in completely the wrong direction just because they have a client. Yeah, what have I have So, Janet Douglas. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, I mean, I would agree with, every, with everything Janet said, and I think a lot of this was covered this morning, but obviously, we can't. We can't develop an effective safety net and safeguarding if we don't know where the goalposts are. And most of my on the ground experience is in low level, unaffiliated grassroots events in the UK. And I would contend there that uh, the understanding of good welfare, as we understand it and as it, as it was articulated today, is frankly across the board not great. Um, so healthcare is fairly well done. People, they may not all do it correctly, but people understand healthcare and that's really well covered in the management. But in terms of moving forward and thinking about horses' mental state and their mental welfare and provision of positive experiences, I think we're a really long way off. Um, at, at organizational level, uh, uh, less so at organizational level than, than, than with owners, but, but certainly I think there's a long way to go. And I think it varies it varies by level of sport. So, you know, at the top end, FEI, much better understood um, than, at, than at grassroots level. Um, it varies, there are differences I see across disciplines, even at uh, FEI level. Um, and as alluded to earlier by Graham, differences, uh, cultural differences, um, so differences are, are across countries. But I would still contend that even at elite level, there's quite a lot of room for improvement in understanding of what good welfare is, and in terms of uh, understanding how important it is to provide for horses' ethological needs, the other 23 hours, um, and, and the importance of providing positives as well as uh, eliminating negatives. So um, I think there's quite a long way to go. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering if I could just pick up on, on something uh, Janet said and uh, tie it in with all of that, which was you, you mentioned that you, know, that you feel horses ought to be comfortable competing at the level they're competing with. And, and that seemed to me to link a little bit to what you were saying about pushy parents. And, and you know, it's sometimes owners who are kind of uh, perhaps driving that. But there's, there's also a commercial imperative, isn't there, particularly with young horses I'm thinking of. And 
I don't know how much evidence we actually have around this, Janet, but you know, there's there is a commercial pressure to get those in some sports, particularly get those big moving young horses out there and either sell them for big money or send them a stud or, or whatever. And do you, do you feel that has a conflict with their welfare needs? Yes, I, I w I'm not, again, like you, I'm not sure um, to what extent we, we have evidence for that, but but certainly I, I, I would think that's a problem. Um, but to some, and to some extent, there's a responsibility that the organizations and the regulators have for that by, you know, if you're going to provide competitions for young horse competitions and you're going to, you provide those competitions and then the judges are going to reward the big flashy movement from the young horses, then inevitably, you know, the riders, the owners, they're going to go for the high marks, they're going to go for what gives them the big bucks. So I, for me, a lot of this at every level comes back to what the regulators are providing and what the judges are, are rewarding. And if you moved, if the judges would move the goalposts, let's say in dressage, and you rewarded a different frame, a different type of movement, if you re if you rewarded those horses that are not tense or whatever, then I think you would, you could change the picture of the sport, and and uh, yeah, and what those horses are experiencing. That's the problem really is how we identify the happy horse. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to touch on what you were saying as well, and it's about as regulators, is it not for us to identify those conflicts? You know, is to, is to look at where are uh, the structures and the processes within our sports inherently conflict and welfare, and what can we do about that? You know, with our understanding of welfare, you mentioned it's the research that we do. We need to understand more about what our athletes and our horses and dogs need in order to live happy lives, um, and then try to avoid those conflicts. Mm -hmm. But sorry, to, to that, I think, so yes, we may not be where we are yet, where we need to be in terms of identifying the positive and what's a happy horse. But I think we know quite a lot about what looks like an unhappy horse, a horse that's in pain, a horse that's experiencing conflict. And I'm not sure that we are, that the sport as a whole and across the different disciplines, across the different levels is marking that down in the way that it should be. And, 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 and that's just the beginning. That's just eliminating the negative. It's not even looking for the positive. Um, we'll open it up to you. So if anyone does have any questions, just pop around it. We'll say one more from the panel and I'll bring my phone. I was just going to say, with respect to what does a good life look like for a horse, my colleagues are sitting there in the audience, Mel Ware and Stella Stevenson, and they've just recently completed and going to soon publicize a um, welfare policy which looks at sort of um, publicizing our industry standards and best practice guidelines and I think that's just the start in bringing our industry participants along that journey of understanding it's not we're not looking just at minimum standards anymore it's it's more aspiration of that and um, I think that the really great job in sort of articulating that in a really um, clear way. So good work for them. Thank you, panel. Uh, let's go to the audience and um, Julie will keep an eye on the Zoom chat. We'll come to Christina next, but we'll take a question from Geneva. Yeah, thank you. Geneva Wilgen, um, specialist equine vets. Um, I have a, a comment to make on I, sorry i forgot your name totally on the left left hand side yeah. Yeah, yeah um you mentioned that you're not worried about health care worried about welfare i would like to disagree i mean the amount of horses that i see on a daily basis that do not have access to proper health care that are don't see a farrier don't have proper dental care are not vaccinated, are not wormed, is horrific, right? So I know there are variations in countries, but particularly in this country, horses healthcare is not up to speed. So that could be a little bit different in, in more elite horses. But the general population, I think that's where we need to start. And that's where the regulator may start to push more about basic understanding of husbandry and basic needs of horses. 
because that has a direct impact on, on their welfare. Thanks, Lee. Janet, would you like to? Um, okay, I'll answer it because I am from here. And so I, I think there is a problem and I agree with you. Uh, Australians have always been pretty laid back and it's always been inexpensive to have a horse in Australia. And um, and the bigger problem I think we have now is the inter-school, I don't know if you have it in Britain, but the inter-school um, talk about pushy parents, the inter-school competitions are taking over. So children are bypassing pony club, coming straight to inter-schools where there's no requirement for any certificate or anything. So they don't actually learn about horse husbandry. They just get the horse, the parents want to see the ribbons and it's possibly not. The education needs to happen. So we, I think, Equestrian Australia need to address that with the inter-school program to make sure that there's education going on for those young riders getting the horses um, so that they actually do know how to look after them correctly because I don't think they're getting any, you know, any help. Thank you. So that's a great reminder that our future focus is not just about thinking of the positive, it's about keeping a focus on the negatives we have still to address. Yeah. Um, if it's okay, can I go on, on? So let's go online now and uh, yeah. invite Christina. Yeah, Christine. Oh, that is loud. Hi, Christina. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the excellent presentations today. And for the discussion you just had about sporting incentives and judging and how they're influencing welfare outcomes, I really enjoyed that part. And so my my question is about, uh, well, recently the FEI publicly committed to ensuring a good life for horses as the fundamental tenet of the FEI equine wellbeing strategy. And I was uh, commenta commenting on the construct of a good life as was presented earlier by Madeline, uh, which uh, seems to rely on the utilitarian calculation of the accumulated positives outweighing the accumulated negatives. This might work well for humans who can reflect, but in the absence of evidence that animals such as horses have the mental capacity to reflect across their lifespans, how can their lived experience be authentically factored into an, a utilitarian calculation of that type? Or to put it another way, how meaningful is this utilitarian good life construct to an animal who can't reflect across their lifespan? Everyone's handing me the microphone rapidly. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so I think the point you make, which is a good one and does actually tie into everything we've been saying today, is you know this is only the start of the conversation. So I think really what we're saying is, yes, that's what we need to be able to do to make sure they have an overall positive experience. And, and yes, we can define that as what we would construe as a good life. I, I agree that we aren't able to know exactly what an animal thinks of as a good life or what its experience is. And as far as we know, it doesn't reflect on it, although we don't even know that for sure. And so, so there's a huge amount we don't know. And, and this is just the starting point of the discussion. And it's exactly why we all need to collaborate. And, you know, I'm an ethicist. I'm not a welfare scientist. I'm not a misologist. I'm not a behavioral scientist. And so we need to get everyone across all of these disciplines working together to, to try and understand what, what really is a good life for an animal and, and in fact there, there are two conferences coming up in New Zealand in just 10 days time the Japan Animals New Zealand conference followed by the International Society of Equitational Science and they are looking at exactly this this issue which is something that Nat Warren who's who's leading both of those conferences flagged up in her work um, when she was chairing the FEI commission that you know we can't really describe and it's exactly what Janet was just saying we, we don't really we can't yet describe what a good life is I'm, I'm just offering a starting point for it really <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. Um, yeah, we're at the beginning of this journey, and these are very complex questions. Yeah. Uh, we've got the else online at the moment. Do we have any other questions or countries? For... Yes, great. Um, I think we have Anna Chis first. Ah, thank uh, you. We might just go for the mic. <laughs> Maybe it's got online. Um, thank you, Stella from Racing Victoria. I guess mine weren't really so forth like intricate 
questions, but it was more observations of some comments that have been made and, you know, that's triggered thought processes that might come through in the workshops this afternoon. Uh, but the first one, Madeline, was when you were speaking about um, when you come through from um, an external coming and looking at that Greyhound strategy and you're pleasantly surprised that they were already doing it. I'm keen to know, coming from a governing agency within racing and, and we go through um, our, strateg our strategies and our new policies, was it the regulators and the authorities within those organisations that were doing it and knowing about the concepts or is it more getting down to that grassroots level and participant level that they were actually already doing um, and providing opportunities for good welfare? That's what I would be interested to compare yeah. our industries. I think probably a bit of both, but mainly on the regulatory side. So, so you know, when I, I was kind of asked to draft this welfare strategy, I kind of said, right, could you just give me everything you've been doing? And was amazed to find what was already there. So um, so there was a lot of, that was being done by the regulator and programs in place that they weren't particularly publicizing. But, but equally, when I then went around and, and talked to trainers, which I spent some time doing, actually, a lot of them were very thoughtful about what they were doing as, as well so and just weren't particularly talking to each other about it actually apart from anything else which which kind of comes to the point that was just being made there about the importance of education and and one of the things the greyhound board has put in place is is to make sure that there are learning opportunities so that those stakeholders can learn from peer experience as well as kind of top-down delivered education yes no i'd agree with that and echo about the trainers you know, that they are already doing the right thing. And I think the key is being able to educate them to show what they're doing is how that's actually contributing and how that can be shared amongst their peers because they might not realise the positive impacts they're having or how that now connects to what we know. I think that's such an important point. And I had a really interesting conversation with Sarah Heath, who many of you all know, who's a veterinary expert in, in behavioural stuff. And, and she had, had been doing a little bit of, of work about um, behavioural assessments and what we might put in place early in a greyhound's life to make its transition at the point of retirement easier for it. And she'd been out to, to visit uh, breeders and trainers and, and, and in my conversation said to her, she, there's this one person who's doing all this fantastic stuff, but they didn't actually know like what they were doing or why they were doing it exactly. They were just more or less intuitively doing all this great stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's great. And the second, I guess, um, thought bubble or, or train of thought that I had applies to um, both of the Janets on the panel. And it was when we were speaking about um, the concept of good welfare or, or what we're doing, we were talking about the physical attributes, but maybe not necessarily thinking about the education or the interactions we have um, to lead to better positive um, experiences. But I was starting to think, is it because at those real grassroots level and perhaps the inter-schools level, they don't have the threat that we do um, at the elite stage or they don't have the threat that we do um, in a sporting stage and in a racing stage. And therefore, um, whether it be the regulators there or the other persons involved, there is no targeted education because they're not currently being threatened. I guess my thoughts is at some point in time, those industries will come under threat and fire like, like we are or most of us are. But I feel that they're so far removed from that um, which is a fortunate thing because they can learn on our experiences and what we're doing and how we're communicating. But it might really highlight in racing, if I think a lot of grassroots people have come from some form of equestrian background and if, they, if they're if they getting the messaging right there, it, it could actually make the grassroots of our participants um, have assist in their education, in fact, could make our jobs easier as regulators. Yeah, I, I, yeah definitely. I think in the UK... Um, I, I think that's the case. You know, the pressure, the public acceptance pressure was on racing first and racing have picked up the mantle and in the UK are moving forward with the welfare strategy. And then other sports, you know, the other disciplines are are, are not as, um, they're, and, and they're coming coming along behind, but, race, but racing had it first. And I certainly see, as an example, Josh said, I work with the UK Pony Club and they're certainly the management there are very aware of the social license concept. So whatever the, motivation i would agree entirely that our motivation should be on improving welfare and social license should follow but i'm not sure not not everybody is going to in horse sport is going to improve welfare for the sake of improving for the horse some people need i think that that fear the stick the fear of of losing public acceptance and what it might do to their sport in order to make them think about the welfare and 
frankly, from my point of view, you know, I don't mind how we get to better welfare. That's where I want to get to. But I do think I've seen it in Pony Club firsthand. The management, they see, they see the threat, and they've been, and they, you know, they're starting to. The, the, the certainly taking on board the welfare concepts, bringing learning theory, behavior, welfare into the Pony Club syllabuses, and then starting to roll that out. So I think it's certainly what I've seen in the UK is playing out exactly as you've described. So I think we're a little bit behind in that here, and we obviously have to address it. But we've talked about it being everyone's responsibility, and this is certainly um, our responsibility to make sure that it does happen. I think that's a question in Australia, Pony Club Australia, the whole thing. I think we need to improve the education from the ground up to address the um, problems of not, not correct vaccination, running, et cetera. But yeah, we, because they're not in the spotlight, I do, I do feel that they are really confronted about. Obviously, the regulations that we have for our FEI goes right down to the grassroots when we run an EBA 65 the rules are the same for them as it is for the four star so in that in that in that area they are actually under the same regulation and just actually Janet's mention of FEI made me think of something and I think the the elite sports shouldn't underestimate their influence too my example is the FEI um, banning whisker trimming and there are lots of people certainly in the UK laughed at that and they thought oh, it's trivial for goodness sake you know there's far bigger welfare things to tackle than trimming whiskers whatever your opinion of that is but that has filtered through so all the people want to compete FEI stopped trimming whiskers and then other people started to say oh well, we shouldn't trim whiskers too and and so now either by regulation or just by kind of uh, um, peer pressure people are starting to question that and and so for me the more you know Places like the FEI, they they have they have proper they have serious power, but they have peer pressure influence too. And I think the more they can do, the more that will give other people, even right down at you know the low levels, a heads up, and it will all improve. I think it's a very rich theme of conversation. But time for one last question, and we can continue this over the break. Over to you, Catherine Ainsworth, um, veterinarian, various equestrian and racing pursuits. Um, this wasn't going to be the subject of my comment. However, for those of you who don't know the current Pony Club Australia Syllabus of Instruction, which was introduced in 2019, which was the first in the world to include equitation science, the first organisation in Australia to have in the equestrian field to have a welfare policy based on the five domains, I would encourage you all to look at it. Pony Club Australia is very heartened that the UK has finally in Pony Club decided to follow Australia's lead. I, no, I absolutely accept that. <laughs> but that was not the subject of my question. Um, my, I was actually going to comment about horse sports in the Olympics because they are on borrowed time. And they're on borrowed time for reasons of the expense and also the number of countries in the world for which equestrian sport is important, let alone the social licence stuff. I would argue that the FEI is not really helping when it comes to dressage and particularly the issue of hyperflexion because every week we will see um, medals and blue ribbons being handed out by dressage judges to horses that show hyperflexion and the hallmarks of the equine pain face and other signs of distress. We cannot trust then politics and human judges to judge such a thing. And I think any of these sports that have, have subjective criteria for judging are very difficult and more prone to being corrupted by politics. So is it now time to replace our human dressage judges with AI? Yeah, I Right, so uh, a nice easy question. <laughs> I think this is going to matter, but I'll just start by saying that we're, but, um, there is actually uh, research going on for that. And at the equity, uh, there's a workshop the afternoon before the Equitation Science Conference in New Zealand, which is in a, week, a couple of weeks, which is uh, lo looking at that. Um, and a bunch of people have looked at um, a whole pile of videos of, as, as a sort of kickoff for that. So looking at the use of um, 
training AI for uh, dressage horses. So I'm really glad to say that that may, be, may become a reality. That's a much better answer than I could have given. So I'm just going to keep quiet now. But I, I think it's an excellent question, and I'm very glad to hear that answer. Josh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I was just checking what's happening there. So that's probably the answer to the question. Um, no, I'm, I don't, I'm not capable of asking that question, but fortunately, Janet knew that some people will be in New Zealand shortly. Okay, <laughs> uh, well, having thoroughly disgraced myself, <laughs> I think that's a great place. Uh, thanks, panel. Uh, these are complex issues, and we have to move that in. Absolutely right. So, thank you again for your excellent participation. This is all about having that willingness to, to engage, and we've done that uh, in the people. So, thank you. Thanks to the panel, great expertise, great insights, tricky questions. I think you've really certainly got me thinking. So, let's break for lunch now. Round of applause, Philip. Uh, you have some gifts for, for the panel. And um, once it's upstairs, Julia, are you able to try to say, yeah, chaperone? Yeah, but please thank everything with you. Yeah, so we're going to be coming to this room. The afternoon, uh, lunch is upstairs, and that's where we'll be spending the afternoon. So. Um, and do a pound of orange juice. Thanks, everybody.